so hello again. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. I was really excited to see how many we had. Um, my name is Brock Schweitzer and I'm the cultural heritage photographer here at the Mariners Museum and Park. To get the elephant out of the room, if you're wondering why a photographer is the one who's presenting this to you today, um, I actually sort of stumbled across Sultana um, listening to a podcast that I really enjoy called Stuff You Missed in History Class. Um, which goes through sort of obscure, relatively unknown people or events in history, um, gives you some details about them, explains them to you. And one of the episodes that they did was about Sultana. And I was absolutely floored that I had never heard this story before. Um, at that point, I'd been working at the museum for a few years uh, and surrounded by maritime history and still had no idea um, about what is the greatest maritime disaster in US history by loss of life. Um, and I, I was just completely blown away that, um, that I hadn't heard it. So I started asking around. A lot of my coworkers hadn't heard this story either. Some knew roughly a few details about it, but not the full extent of the story. So I really kind of took it upon myself as a personal mission uh, that we should know more about this. I did more digging in our collection, found more information, watched some things, read some books, um, and put together this presentation so that I can share with all of you something that I think should really be much more a part of our collective maritime heritage and something that we can remember um, and that we can look back on uh, and give it its, its due attention. So if you're wondering why something this big kind of went unnoticed. If you've never heard about this and you're wondering how you've missed it this entire time as well, you are absolutely not alone. Uh, a lot of people didn't. Um, this is a quote uh, by a man named William Fies, uh, written in 1892. Um, one of the survivors of the Sultana disaster, who we will talk about uh, more in a little while, um, gathered reminiscences of survivors of the event, got their takes on it, um, the experiences that they had so that it could all be collected, written down um, and kept track of so that they could share it for, forth with people. Um, and William Fies, one of the survivors, uh, was quoted saying, it was without a doubt the greatest marine disaster on record in either ancient or modern times. And I am surprised that so little is remembered about it at this time, and especially by persons who were at that time great readers and can to this day tell you all about some battle or skirmish or other disaster where the loss of life was trifling as compared to this. So even in 1892, um, very briefly after the disaster, it wasn't widely known. Um, so even the survivors were surprised that so little was talked about and that people who were really enthusiastic about the Civil War and its history and everything that happened couldn't recount this story. So one of the big reasons, actually the big reason that this sort of passed under everybody's radar is that it happened right at the end of April of 1865. Um, if you are a fan of Civil War history or just in general know a bit about US uh, history, then you probably have heard the month April 1865 over and over again. It was without a doubt one of the most, if not the most, um, formative months for the Union and for our nation. So just to give you a little bit of background of where we are at the time, we're going to start at the beginning of April of 1865, um, the night of the 2nd into the morning of the 3rd. Uh, Union forces had been quickly approaching Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. Um, and they had reached and were able to actually enter unopposed. They found Richmond burning and completely abandoned by Confederate soldiers um, who were backed into a corner and had fled. Not long after they found themselves surrounded, they were cut off from supplies. And so General Robert E. Lee had no choice but to surrender to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Soon thereafter, um, President Abraham Lincoln attending a showing of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater uh, is shot fatally by John Wilkes Booth, um, while several other conspirators were involved in a plot to take out several people. Um, the other conspirators were named uh, Lewis Powell, who attacked uh, William Seward, the Secretary of State, but failed to kill him. He wounded him, but um, was otherwise unsuccessful in his mission. Um, George Azarot was supposed to attack Andrew Johnson, the Vice President, but he failed in his attempt to attack. 
Um, and so nothing ended up happening there. And then David Harold assisted John Wilkes Booth with his, with his getaway, um, letting him escape from Ford's theater. The next morning at 7.22 AM, President Abraham Lincoln succumbs to his wound and is pronounced dead. Um, Vice President Andrew Johnson immediately after is sworn in as the new president of the United States and all but vows revenge against the people responsible. On April 26th of the month, um, Confederate, Confederate General, General Robert or jo Joseph E. Johnston, sorry, got really tongue-tied there, um, surrenders to Union General William Tecumseh Sherman near Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, this effectively, more than anything else, sort of ended the Civil War. This is sort of the moment where we can point to and be like, that's, that's when the fighting really came to an end. There were some skirmishes that were still occurring, but the bulk of Confederate forces had surrendered at this point, um, and the Civil War really came to a close. That same day, actually, John Wilkes Booth was cornered in a barn near Bowling Green, Virginia, um, and Boston Corbett, Sergeant Boston Corbett of the 16th New York Cavalry, shot him fatally, um, and a few hours later, John Wilkes Booth died. So that's what's happening in the nation at this time. Uh, the entire month of April, these enormous, high-profile, really important events are occurring in our country. So it's sort of no wonder that a steamboat on the Mississippi is going to sort of pass under everybody's radar and not really get the notice that you would think that it normally would. So we're gonna backpedal a little bit at this time to March of 1865, just a little bit earlier in the year. And we're going to go to Andersonville Prison Camp, which is located in Georgia. Uh, this is an image that was taken um, showing Andersonville Prison Camp. Um, it was active for 14 months during the Civil War, and during that time, it housed more than 45,000 Union prisoners. Um, of those 45,000, around 13,000 died while housed at Andersonville Prison Camp. Um, statistically speaking, you were more likely to die in a prison camp than you were to die in any battle. Uh, the, the loss of life was enormous in these prison camps. There were no governing bodies to protect prisoners of war. Um, there was nothing to guide how they were to be treated or any quality that they were to be, um, to be given. And so it was very, very likely that you would die. Um, this image shows you the conditions that these men were forced to live in. You can see the sort of ramshackle tents and lean-tos that are like sort of spread out across the back, um, the back of the lawn there. This wooden structure that you can see towards the front of the image um, feeding into that source of water is the latrine, um, which is going into pretty much one of the only water sources that's available to the prisoners at this time. Uh, they are also at the same time being kept on very, very limited rations, um, some hardtack, some beans, that's about the extent of it. They really weren't given any nutritious meals. Um, most of them were sick. They were succumbing to disease and exposure. They were malnourished. Um, there are photos, I didn't include any in this presentation, um, but there are photos where you can see survivors of Andersonville prison camp who are completely emaciated. They are literally skin and bones. Um, I liken the images to survivors of the Holocaust. It's a very similar appearance where, where they are just um, shells of, of themselves. Um, the yellow arrow that you can see down here in the right-hand corner of the image is pointing to um, a very small fence that sort of winds its way along there. I actually just thought, I added this because I think it's really interesting. That's what's called a deadline. Um, so Andersonville camp has wooden palisade walls that are surrounding it. And this deadline is set back about 19 feet inside that wall. And it's referred to as the deadline because if you try to cross it, um, you are shot and killed. No questions asked, no second chances. The assumption is that you are making a break for it. You're going to do something you shouldn't be doing. Um, and so the uh, prison guards aren't gonna take any chances. Um, and that's, that's the end of it. Uh, Obviously we've changed what that word means, but I thought it was really interesting that this is actually where that comes from is um, inside these prison camps, having deadlines inside of the walls that you were not allowed to cross. Uh, other prisoners who ended up eventually boarding Sultana 
um, came from Cahaba Prison Camp, which is in Alabama. Uh, I couldn't find any images of Cahaba, but stories from there make it seem like it was not any better than Andersonville. If anything, it might have been worse. Um, it was parked right on the edge of a river. Um, in the spring, there was a lot of flooding that occurred, um, and they report spending weeks in knee-high water, having to climb up on top of things in order to sit down or lie down or get any kind of rest without being just in water at all times. Um, they had the same level of sickness and disease and exposure problems that were had at Andersonville, but on a slightly smaller scale. Um, on March 20th of 1865, uh, negotiations were finally completed for an exchange of prisoners of war. The Union agreed to give up some, um, and the Confederacy agreed to give up some, and some of those prisoners came from Andersonville and Cahaba prison camps. The people who were being housed at Andersonville at the time reported that there was no fanfare, there was no official declaration, there was no real anything. The guards simply opened the doors, the gates, and said, get what you need and leave. Um, and so the parolees gathered what few rations they can. You can see this il illustration and the man scooping up what he can into his pack. So they gathered what they could. Um, they gathered what clothes they had for themselves, packed up some of their tents and they set out. They were given a destination and very, very little else. So the parolees had to travel pretty extensively. Um, in order to reach Vicksburg in Mississippi, which was their final destination where they would be able to board boats and travel back up north. Um, they were taken to a train station from Andersonville Prison um, and they boarded a train that was heading for Montgomery, Alabama. Um, the series of events that occur next are mind boggling to me that they were able in their week sick, injured, malnourished condition um, that any of them were able to make it through this. Um, so from, from Montgomery, uh, they boarded a steamboat and sailed down the Alabama River to reach Selma, Alabama, where they boarded another train, which took them to Meridian, Mississippi. From Meridian, they board another boat that goes down the Tumbigbee River. Um, and then from there onto another train before they finally reach Meridian. And then from Meridian, they were to travel to Camp Fisk right outside of Vicksburg on foot. Um, so they had a blend of several trains, several boats, and a lot of travel on foot. And you can see the totals here of roughly how far they had to travel for each of these steps. In total, 432 miles worth of traveling, um, which is a very, very long way to go for anybody, let alone if you are in the state that the men who were released from these prisons were. Um, during this journey, a number of the people who had been paroled ended up dying, either succumbing to illness or wounds. Um, there were no less than two different train accidents that caused injuries and deaths of a few more parolees. Um, it was a really harrowing journey that capped off what was a really harrowing stay at Andersonville Prison. Uh, the parolees finally reached the Union headquarters at Vicksburg um, on the 1st of April, um, 1865. And this is a quote from Chester Berry, who I told you compiled the stories from survivors of this event into one book. Um, and the whole foreword of the book is him remembering what he went through and what it was like. And he says, we were happy with our meager rations, finding more joy in looking up at that old flag that we loved so dearly than in anything else. And it seemed to us that the all-wise ruler had gotten up a bit of sunshine and a small breeze in order that we might see that glorious emblem of liberty proudly unfold itself and kiss the sunshine. I have seen many beautiful things in my life, but never anything that looked more beautiful than the flag of my country did upon that first day of April, 1865. So that's what he remembered upon reaching the Union headquarters at Camp Fisk right outside of Vicksburg, which you can see um, an illustration of here. Um, right on the banks of the Mississippi River. Camp Fisk was set a few miles back um, and that's where they would have been held. The parolees were held there for 23 days in total. Um, and as this was the Union headquarters, they were officially back under the protection and care of the United States government. So things were better. Do not mistake me, things were much better. They certainly improved. But because of the nature of supply lines being a bit in shambles, 
um, because there wasn't a lot to spare for men who weren't fighting, because there wasn't a lot to spare for these parolees. They were still kept in less than optimal conditions given how they were, like what shape they were in. Um, they were still given very little in the way of food, more certainly, um, but they couldn't spare a lot. Um, they didn't really have spare clothing, um, even finding bedding and that sort of thing was difficult to come by at this time. So they were kept in better circumstances, certainly, significantly better circumstances, um, but still not enough to recover from what they went through. They started to, some of them certainly um, started to heal their wounds a little bit. Some of them started to get over illnesses and diseases, um, but there was still some level of that continuing on just by the nature of the time period that we're looking at and how uh, just disheveled things were in the South at this time. So they began their road to recovery. Um, and then on the 24th of April, that's when they're going to start boarding Sultana. Um, so now our, our boat finally comes into the picture. Um, so Sultana launched on January 3rd, 1862. So it was a few years old, um, but not terribly old. It was a uh, well-appointed boat by most accounts. Um, it was very nicely decorated on the inside. Um, it was fast. It was known for being very quick on traveling up and down the Mississippi River. Um, and it was stationed in the north. Um, on April 15th of 1865, um, it is docked in Cairo, Illinois, and its captain at the time, James Cass Mason, hears the news about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Mason is an interesting character who sort of sank everything he had into Sultana. He wasn't its first captain. In fact, I think he was his fi its fifth or sixth captain. Um, but he had really put himself into this boat and its success and pouring himself and his money and his resources into making sure that it was going to be something that was successful and would see a huge return on investment. Um, he wasn't a great businessman, but he certainly was an obsessive businessman. So upon hearing that Lincoln had been assassinated, he comes up with the idea that since communication lines are cut in the South, um, because communication is different, difficult to come by for a lot of people in the South, he would load up with as many newspapers as he could carry that had information about Lincoln's assassination, and he would travel South and sell them at a markup and make some money off of sharing this news. Um, if you ignore that fact, it sounds almost altruistic, like he just wants them to know, uh, but it was certainly, if nothing else, a ploy for money. And so on the 15th, he sets off from Cairo, Illinois with this information, with these newspapers um, and heads down the river. On his way to the South, he starts to hear people talking about how the government is willing to pay steamboat captains for any Union soldiers, parolees in particular, that they can ferry back up the Mississippi River to the North, bring them back up to Illinois. They're willing to pay $5 per enlisted soldier, and then $10 per officer. And so Mason books it straight for Vicksburg as fast as he possibly can because he wants in on that, on that money. So uh, the Sultana arrives in Vicksburg and uh, Captain Mason is greeted by a man by the name of Reuben Hatch. Um, he's a colonel and the chief quartermaster for the Department of Mississippi. So another very, very interesting character has come into the frame for us to keep in mind as we're going through this story. Um, Reuben Hatch was formerly the assistant quartermaster in Cairo, Illinois. Um, he's not a good person. Um, Reuben Hatch was caught red-handed cooking the books as assistant quartermaster in Illinois. Um, he was selling lumber at a huge markup and then was rewriting the invoices for the actual cost and pocketing the remainder. He was also caught using hired muscle to coerce people and to force them into paying these higher amounts that he could then skim off the top of. So he gets caught. Um, and Ulysses S. Grant is going to have him court-martialed when he hears about this and have him just completely kicked out. But Colonel Reuben Hatch is a very well-connected individual. His brother, Ozias Hatch, is the Secretary of State for Illinois. Um, some, some of you, if not all of you, probably know that President Abraham Lincoln, he's from Illinois. 
Um, and Ozias Hatch is a good friend of his, and not only a good friend, but a chief fundraiser and financier for Lincoln in his campaign. So his brother Ozias, Reuben's brother Ozias, writes a letter to Abraham Lincoln and says, my brother is not such a bad guy. He made a mistake. He promises he won't do it again. He just got caught up in this whole thing. And we really would just appreciate it if you would make this go away. And Lincoln does. Uh, Lincoln sends a message to Grant and says, you need to leave Reuben Hatch alone. I'll take him out of Illinois so that there's hopefully no problems there. We're going to send him down to Mississippi. He'll be the chief quartermaster in Mississippi, and it'll be fine. So that's how Reuben Hatch ends up where he's at right now. So Mason is greeted by Reuben Hatch, and the two of them talk. And Mason says, I want to take as many people as you can possibly give me to ferry back up north. Um, there is no concrete proof of what happened during this conversation. There's no written account of it. There's just a lot of speculation. And a lot of the speculation is probably fairly accurate and reliable. And that speculation is that during this negotiation, Mason and Hatch agreed to split some of the profits. That the more people Hatch could give Mason to board Sultana to take up north, the more of a percentage Mason was willing to give him for what he was going to make for ferrying these men back up. So they agree, they reach an agreement. Hatch agrees as many people as they can possibly fit aboard Sultana, they will fit them aboard. I'll send you off with them and, and we have a deal. So Mason, while everything is getting prepared, um, muster rolls are meant to be prepared while they're getting these parolees together and getting them over to be ready to go. Um, Mason leaves Vicksburg and he travels down to New Orleans um, where he does some trading. He delivers more information on the newspapers about Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Um, he purchases some goods, he takes some commercial passengers on, um, and then returns back to Vicksburg. On his return journey, a man by the name of Nathan Wintringer, who's the chief engineer for Sultana, notices that one of its four boilers is starting to buckle. It's starting to bulge on the outside. He sees it and he knows that it's going to be a big problem. He tells Mason about it. And whenever they pull back into Vicksburg, they decide to reach out to a local boiler maker, a man by the name of R.G. Taylor. Taylor comes aboard um, and he takes a look at this boiler and sees that it's bulging. And he says to Mason and to Wintringer, this is gonna take a week to do a proper repair on. And honestly, you shouldn't be repairing it. You should be replacing this entire boiler. It's, it's in really bad shape. Um, Mason isn't willing to wait. If he has to wait that long, then all of these parolees are going to be loaded up onto other boats um, that are then going to get paid for taking them back up north. And he stands to lose out on a lot of money from this deal. So they try to convince Taylor to just do the repair. It's fine, just put a patch on it. We promise you that when we get back to Cairo, we will have it replaced entirely. We'll, we'll take care of it. Um, Taylor, to his initial credit, says no. I'm not gonna have any part of this. This is bad and if you try to leave, there's gonna be consequences to that. And so he leaves. What's interesting is that inexplicably, he comes back just hours later. There is no account that I could find anywhere to explain why Taylor comes back to Sultana, but he does. And he says, you know what? Okay, I'll, I'll put a patch on it. Just promise me you're gonna get it fixed once you get back up to Cairo, Illinois. And they say, of course, we'll do that. And so he begins his work and says, I'll only need a few hours. So in the meantime, Sultana is free to start to be loaded with parolees who are on their way back up north. So now we cut to Camp Fisk, which as I said, is a few miles outside of Vicksburg um, where the parolees are being held. Um, a man by the name of Captain Frederick Speed uh, agrees to take on the duty of preparing muster rolls to um, get an account of all of the parolees before they're sent over to start loading on two boats. Um, the initial idea was that we would have the muster rolls, we would know every single person who went through here, they'll be loaded onto a bunch of different boats, all of those boats will go north, everything will run smoothly. And Frederick Speed is on board with that. He, he thinks that that's the plan. And he's filling in for a man by the name of George Williams, who had left his post not long ago to report rumors of bribery 
having to do with something else unrelated to this. So Williams isn't there. Frederick Speed says, sure, I'll take this on. So he starts working on the monster rolls while Sultana is traveling to New Orleans and coming back. Um, Captain Williams gets back around the time that Sultana is prepared to be boarded. And he says to Frederick Speed, why don't we not worry about the muster rolls right now? We'll just get an account of people and then we'll deal with the muster rolls later. We'll take care of all the paperwork. It doesn't have to be done right this second. We really just wanna get these people moving. We wanna get them going home. So they agree and they divide up the work. Frederick Speed stays at Camp Fisk. Williams goes and um, stays with Sultana. The plan being that trains will be prepared at Camp Fisk. They will go over to the waterfront. They'll board on Sultana. There's double accounting for everybody who is um, going from the camp to boarding on the boat. So at this time, a few other boats start to arrive and Reuben Hatch steps in and he blocks them from being able to take any passengers. And he tells Williams and he tells Frederick Speed that every single parolee that we have left, I want boarded on Sultana. So they agree that they will load as many as they possibly can, but that it's probably unrealistic to board everybody. So Frederick Speed at Camp Fisk loads up a train of people, gets them ready and sends them off to Vicksburg to the waterfront to load on board. And it's about 800 men that are on this first train. Those 800 men are counted. They are boarded onto Sultana um, and then they're, they're ready for, for more. But it's at this time that again, a couple of things that are really inexplicable happen. First is that Frederick Speed leaves his post at Camp Fisk where he is counting and preparing men and loading them on a train to be heading to the waterfront. He leaves with no reason given. He just goes away. Williams starts to hear mutterings again about bribery, which he was already sensitive to because he had been going after that for something else. So he hears that there's bribery happening and he suspects that it's Frederick Speed who's taking bribes um, from captains of these boats. And so he leaves to report to his superior officer about the bribery that he's hearing about. And so at this time, there is nobody at Camp Fisk accounting for people loading on a train, and there is nobody at Sultana accounting for people loading onto the boat. And so another train leaves containing about 700 men who are boarded on Sultana with no one realizing that it's happened. Frederick Speed comes back to his post. Williams comes back to his post after reporting that he's hearing about bribery, and they prepare another train of about 800 more people that get sent off and that get boarded on Sultana. Um, Sultana's decks at this point are starting to sag uh, and Mason orders timbers to be brought aboard to support and shore up the decks that are beginning to sag under the weight of how many people were aboard. There are also reports from survivors that they heard the hammering and the work that was happening on the boiler. And they thought that it was strange, but they were so excited about the idea of getting to finally leave here that they didn't really question it. They also didn't question the fact that there was no room left anywhere on Sultana. It was basically standing room only. If you could find anywhere to sit down or to lie down, you were an incredibly fortunate person. But most of them thought, it's fine, we're not going that far, so we'll just deal with it. Because after this is done, after the hell that we've been through, we'll get to be home. So the image that I have here is Lady Gay, which is another boat that had arrived um, in order to take passengers. The Lady Gay and one other boat that had arrived during this time that Sultana was being loaded, both end up departing Vicksburg with 17 passengers between them. That's it, 17 passengers. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at about 2,300 paroled prisoners who were loaded aboard Sultana. While they were in New Orleans, they also picked up around 100 commercial passengers who were given the staterooms and the nicer accommodations aboard the boat. The Sultana also had a crew of about 85 people and they were sent with 21 military guards to help control order. In total, 
about 2,500 people were aboard this boat. Sultana's legal capacity was 376 people. 376 people was the legal rated capacity for a boat that now had 2,500 individuals aboard it. In addition, during this journey, they also picked up 70 to 100 mules and horses, 100 hogs, and a large alligator in a wooden box that Mason bought when he was in New Orleans because he thought it was interesting and that he would be able to sell it for a pretty big price in the North where it would be a novelty. They also had 250 hogsheads of sugar, each weighing about 1,200 pounds, and 97 cases of wine. All of this was aboard this one small Mississippi River steamer. Uh, this quote is one that like, hit me the hardest. Um, they kept talking about everyone just being elated because we would be home in a few days. That's all it's gonna take, just a few days and we get to be home and this nightmare gets to be over. So Sultana departs from Vicksburg um, at around 9 p.m. on April the 24th. Um, it travels north uh, and stops in Helena, Arkansas. Um, during the stop, a photographer who is in Helena sees Sultana just loaded with people, just covered as far as he can see with people. And he is amazed at this site. And so he gets his camera, takes it over to the waterfront and sets it all up so that he can take this photograph that you're looking at right now, which is one of the only known photographs of Sultana to exist. Um, and the only one that shows the crowded conditions. You can see how many people are just absolutely everywhere on this boat. So he brings his camera over and somebody on board notices it and yells to everybody, hey, there's somebody taking a picture. Everyone come over, be in this, be in this photo. So everybody starts to come over to one side of the boat, which is very, very heavily laden with people. And as they all start to shift to that side, the boat itself starts to tilt hard to the side to the point where it would have nearly collapsed. Uh, Mason runs out and yells for everybody to please go back, go back to the other side, go back. Please go stay where you are. Don't move around too much. Everything is shifting and that's going to be bad for us. Um, so Mason pretty much orders people um, to please just find a place, stay in that place, don't move around too much, because that's going to cause us to shift a lot given how much weight we're carrying. So from Helena, the Sultana moves to Memphis. Um, some of our passengers then disembark from the boat. They go out, they were sent money by family while they were in Camp Fisk. And so they go out with their money um, to saloons that are nearby and taverns to drink and to eat and to celebrate the fact that they're going home and to enjoy themselves for a little while while Sultana does some trading, takes on a couple more commercial passengers um, and refuels a little bit. Uh, when Sultana is ready to depart, um, the military guard that came with Sultana were dispatched out into Memphis to find everybody they possibly can and to round them back up and bring them back aboard. Anybody who stays in Memphis, anybody who gets left behind is money that Mason doesn't get um, at the end of the day. So everybody is brought back aboard. They're loaded up and Sultana departs. It goes across the river, across the Mississippi to the other side to coal docks where it loads up on coal. Um, and then it's ready to depart soon thereafter. Um, one soldier, a man by the name of George Downing, um, saw Sultana going away um, and realized that he had been left behind. And so thinking quickly, he goes down to the dock and he offers money to a fisherman with a small boat and says, please, will you just take me across to the coal dock so that I can get back on board? That's my, that's my ride home. And the, the man agrees and he takes George across um, and George gets back on Sultana. Um, and he is quoted as saying that he was so fortunate that his family sent him money because if he hadn't had that money, he wouldn't have been able to get aboard Sultana and he wouldn't have been able to go home. George Downing didn't survive the journey. His is one of the most unfortunate stories that I read. So to give you just a little bit of explanation about Sultana and the way that it's powered, it has four of these tubular boils, boilers, which were fairly new for the time, um, sort of the latest technology, but also known for being fairly finicky. So they had four lined up side by side. It was the second from their starboard side that had bulged and was very quickly patched over. 
um, the bulge was still there. To give you some more background, uh, this is in April, right? So there's a lot of spring thaw that's starting to happen in places near the Mississippi River. And all of that water is flowing down and the Mississippi at this time is flowing very fast, very cold and very, very high. All of that combined plus the weight that Sultana is currently carrying means that its boilers have to work extra, extra hard to keep any amount of speed going on this boat. They're fighting a really fast moving, really high tide um, that they are trying to push against with this enormous load of people that they are carrying. So the boilers are running really hot. If you'll remember what I said just a little while ago about the shifting of the boat when people were moving around. As people are moving just naturally a little bit, the boat starts to rock ever so slightly. As it's rocking, the water is sloshing away from parts of the boiler and then flooding back to those parts of the boiler. So what ends up happening is that as the water moves away from parts of the boiler, that metal becomes really, really hot. There's nothing else to take that heat but the metal. So the metal gets superheated. As the boat settles back the other direction, all of that water rushes to that side, hits that superheated metal, and there's a sudden spike in the steam pressure that's built up inside this boiler, a really sudden welling of pressure. So keep that in mind. Um, Remember that the decks are sagging, timbers have been brought on board to support them. Keep in mind that the wood that these boats were made out of was often very lightweight wood to keep them light and fast. Um, and paint at this time was incredibly fl flammable. Um, and you'll get a recipe for what one author that I read described as an orderly pile of kindling wood. So at approximately 1 a.m. on the 27th of April, the boiler that was damaged explodes. And as it explodes, it sends shrapnel and steam flying into the two boilers beside it, which immediately detonate as well. Three total boilers burst and send a jet of steam upward through the decks and rip the pilot house clean off of the boat. The force of this sends debris and shrapnel and people flying everywhere. It scalds and burns and kills some immediately, sends others flying into the cold, fast-moving waters of the Mississippi River. Um, it just leaves devastation. After that initial burst, the splintered wood that is surrounding this hole that's now created starts to break and fall downward into what is the furnace of the boat, which is underneath the boiler deck. And so wood is breaking and falling down into the furnace. And this lightweight wood that is coated in flammable paint goes up in an instant. In total, it's reported that it took 20 minutes and no more for the entirety of Sultana to be engulfed in flames. So as this wood is burning, as the structure for the smokestacks that you can see in this image are beginning to weaken, one falls aft. So it falls to the back of the boat and one falls forward. It falls onto the bow. Um, as the one falls aft, it splinters more wood and shoves it down into the furnace even more, which just increases the rate at which the, the fire begins to spread. At first, everything is fanning to the aft section of the boat, but soon one of the wheelhouses cracks and starts to fall away, but doesn't entirely detach. So now it's sitting at an angle which means that Sultana with no pilot house, no power, no guidance, and with a wheel sitting at an angle begins to spin. As it spins, the wind direction is going to start to change in relation to the boat itself. And so the flames that were originally fanning aft begin to fan towards the bow. And soon the entirety of Sultana is just completely engulfed in flames. Um, it begins to just drift. Um, on fire, spinning slowly, and eventually gets caught on the edge of a small island where it sticks into the mud and continues to burn down to the water line before the, remaining, the remainder of the hull just slips beneath the water and settles into the silt and the mud. All of this happened very, very quickly. Murray, um, Murray S. Baker, who was from Canton, Michigan, 
when he boarded Sultana, um, attempted to find a place to lie down near the boilers, thinking that's the warmest spot, that's where I'm going to be the most comfortable. Um, he was sick, he was cold, he wanted to just be somewhere where he was comfortable, but he couldn't find any room. A lot of people had the same thought that the boiler deck would be really warm, it would be really nice to lay down there and sleep there, and so he couldn't find any room and ended up going toward the after door of the boat. Um, he was awoken to the sound of an explosion um, and heard people running around, heard a bunch of commotion and confusion um, and didn't know what was happening. So he got up to investigate and he didn't really see anything from where he was. But as he was turning around to go back and he opened the aft door and stepped outside, he could see the flames beginning to spread. He could see people hurtling towards the water, people jumping clear of the boat. And so he says uh, in this quote here, it was one of the worst sights I ever witnessed. Men who were scalded and bruised were crawling over one another to get out of the fire. I went to the side of the boat and pulled a board off to help me get ashore. So Murray goes to the wheelhouse um, and he pulls a board off of the wall, um, throws it into the water and then jumps in after it. He clings to that board with all of his life and tries to paddle as hard as he can despite his weak, weakened state, but despite his sickness um, to try to get to the side of the river. He finds that he can't get to the shore that he was aiming for, but that the current is sort of carrying him the other way a little bit. And so he turns and tries to paddle as quickly as he can over to the opposite shore. Um, he eventually finds his, his, his way to some floodwood um, where he's able to get himself up onto the shore and he collapses and passes out for an unknown amount of time. Um, eventually he's found by rescuers and he's taken back um, to be treated. Um, A.C. Brown, oh wait, Hiram Allison, sorry, my, my notes were in a little bit of a, a weird order there. Um, Hiram Allison, who is from Franklin County, Pennsylvania, which is very near to my hometown, um, so I felt a, a personal connection to, to this one. Um, he was on the hurricane deck quite near the wheel, wheelhouse whenever he heard the boom of the initial explosion. Um, he jumped up as quickly as he could and he looked around to see what was going on and that's when he saw the hole that had been ripped through the deck that he was standing on. He was fortunate enough to be far enough away to not have been impacted by the initial explosion. Um, he con concluded immediately that his best course of action was to just get off of that boat as fast as he possibly can, knowing that it wasn't going to last very long under its current conditions. Um, he runs from the hurricane deck to the cabin deck towards the aft of the boat, removing clothing as he goes to make himself as lightweight as possible. And as soon as he reaches the, um, the rear of the boat, he leaps into the water and into the rushing waves of the Mississippi. Um, as he's drifting, he notices a horse trough that had, a trough that had been um, blown free of the boat. Um, and he swims to it as hard as he can and gets himself onto the middle of it and notices that there are two soldiers on either side. And he says, when I caught up with the two comrades, they were both praying. When I got on with them, I said, that was a terrible disaster. They made no reply, but kept right on praying. I said no more to them. And when it was light enough for me to see, they were gone. He managed to stay clinging to that horse trough as hard as he could until it came to rest in some brush and some logs on the Arkansas bank of the river um, where he was eventually rescued and taken to the hospital. Now to A.C. Brown, uh, who's from Claremont County, Ohio. He actually, interestingly, spent his evening hours coming up with a plan of what he would do if something went wrong. He noticed how many people were aboard. He noticed the sagging decks. He heard the boiler being repaired and he thought to himself, something, if something went wrong, there would be chaos. How am I gonna handle that if, if something is, is horribly amiss? So he spends his time planning. As an officer, um, A.C. Brown is given one of the staterooms to share with other officers. So he's got slightly more comfortable quarters and he goes there eventually and he falls asleep. He wakes up reportedly on the opposite side of the room of where he remembers falling asleep. He had been thrown across the room and that was how he woke up. Um, he wakes up and sees steam, he sees fire that's beginning and he knows that something's gone wrong, but fortunately he had done some level of planning and so he seemed to stay level headed. So he makes his way towards a room that was occupied by female commercial passengers who were aboard um, and a single child. There was one child who was aboard the boat. He goes back and helps them with the child getting them 
ready, getting them uh, prepared, um, putting a life vest on the, the child and then helps the women and this young, young child to the edge and helps them into the water. He reportedly helped a woman throw her trunk overboard. She was carrying it with her and trying to get in, in, into the water to save it from the boat. So he helps her throw it and then she jumps in. And then once he had helped them, he makes for the water himself. But before he hits the surface, he's hit on the head hard by a piece of debris and sort of slips beneath the water. While underwater, he sort of regains himself slightly and tries to make for the surface, but then he feels hands that grab a hold of his leg and he's being grappled by a drowning man that he's fighting against and trying to get to the surface as desperately as he can. Eventually the drowning man breaks his grasp and AC Brown makes his way to the surface and starts to swim away from the boat. And he says, when about three or 400 yards away from the boat, the whole heavens seemed to be lighted up by the conflagration. Hundreds of my comrades were fastened down by the timbers of the decks and had to burn. While the water seemed to be one solid mass of human beings struggling with the waves, the light and the screams at this time cannot be described. Um, A.C. Brown, who weighed no more than 100 pounds at the time, eventually found his way to a half-submerged tree that he managed to haul himself up to, where he sat freezing. His clothing had been ripped away from him, so he was naked and cold and eventually passed out until a, spotting, a passing boat spotted him and was able to pull him down to safety. So as Sultana is floating down the river. Um, it is passed by the Bostonia II on its maiden voyage, and they see people floating in the water. Uh, the captain orders them to throw anything that they possibly can into the water to help to give people flotation devices, anything that can help them get something to cling onto to help them get through this. They start pulling people from the water as best they can. They do everything they can to help until they realize that there's only so much that they can do and that they need a lot more judging by the people that are floating down past. So they turn and they make their way to Memphis as quickly as they possibly can. But by the time they get there, it actually turns out that Memphis had already mobilized. Um, one of the people who was blown free of Sultana initially actually floated past the waterfront at Memphis and screamed and yelled and made a fuss so that they would hear him and see him and know that something was going on. And so Memphis, before dawn had even hit, was absolutely mobile. They were moving as quickly as they could. Every vessel that was able to hit the water was in the water and on its way to help as best they can, including the USS Tyler, which you see here. Everything from commercial vessels, paddle wheel steamers, gunboats such as the Tyler, fishing boats, canoes, kayaks, anything anybody could get on the water was in the water and ready to go help whoever they possibly could. In total, about 700 people were rescued by this effort, which is a good number of people. Not as many as we would hope, of course, but it's a decent number of people. In Memphis, hospitals overflowed. Caskets ran out very quickly. Bodies had to be pulled from the water, laid on the dock and covered with a thin sheet for the time being. The rescue efforts continued the entire following day with boats patrolling up and down the Mississippi looking for anybody that they could. There's a particularly sad story that one of the female passengers was a newlywed bride. Um, and there are a lot of reports of her new husband who had managed to survive wandering up and down the shores near Memphis for days, if not weeks afterwards looking for her and he never found her. So with the rescue efforts, we have 700 saved. Unfortunately, that means about 1,800 lives were lost in the disaster of the Sultana, which is why it is our greatest maritime disaster still to this day. 1,800 total people, again on a boat with a legal capacity of 376, 1,800 people died. Eventually, the survivors who were well enough uh, were loaded onto other boats much more spaced out and continue their, their journey north um, and had to pass directly by the spot where Sultana, where the remainder of the hull was sitting in the mud. Um, they, they had to just sail right past it as they went as a reminder of what they had been through. So pretty immediately, as you might expect, trials were launched to figure out what exactly happened here and who was to blame for this. 
there were a few people who were very immediately at the top of the list for who could be held responsible. The first and the most obvious is Captain George Mason. This is a picture of him. Um, he was obviously one of the people who was most responsible as he was one of the people who forced this many people aboard, never said anything about it being too crowded, never thought second to be like, maybe I shouldn't take this many people. So he's obviously one of our first suspects. But Mason actually went down with the boat. He died in the disaster. To his credit, it is not enough to make up for what he did in my opinion, but to his credit, a lot of survivors report having seen him trying to help people to get off of the boat, to get overboard. He was trying to do what he could for them. So with Mason dead, the next person that we can probably look at is Colonel Reuben Hatch. This is a sketch of him. Uh, he's obviously culpable in this entire thing because there are definitely a lot of rumors surrounding him taking bribes. There's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that he would have um, and that he did. Uh, he had a history of bribery and extortion, so it's not certainly outside of the realm. And since he was in charge at Vicksburg, it would have been him who was the direct person over top of all of this who should have been putting an end to it instead of helping it along. But Reuben Hatch, immediately upon hearing the Sultana disaster, quits the army and leaves the state of Mississippi. And at that time, the response that the army had was, he left, he's a civilian now, there's nothing we can do. He's beyond our reach. And so Reuben Hatch leaves and gets away with it, no problem. Another person that we can certainly look at is George Williams, who I couldn't find an image for. Um, George Williams left his post at Sultana. He was the one who was counting people who, who were going aboard. He didn't put a stop to it at any point. Um, he should have been there to be like, no, that's too many, that's enough, we, we quit there. Um, but George Williams was a graduate of West Point. And so what ended up happening is that they decided that they weren't going to press charges against him because he's one of us. He's a fellow, he's a graduate of West Point, he's an army guy, and so we're not gonna go after him. So the only person that's remaining in this that could potentially be held responsible is Frederick Speed, who was a Camp Fisk. He left his post when he should have been there. He could have stepped in, he could have tried to do something, but didn't. And so Frederick Speed is the last remaining person who can possibly be held responsible. And at first he was. Um, he was found uh, guilty for grossly overcrowding the ship, for negligence, for leaving his post. But because there weren't significant, sufficient grounds to charge him with this because there were plenty of other people ahead of him in the chain of command who didn't do anything. Um, and because he was never actually at the waterfront loading people onto Sultana, he was simply preparing the trains and sending them to be loaded about, aboard the boat. He wasn't held responsible either. A judge advocate general of the army cleared him. So in the end, no one, not a single person was held responsible for the loss of 1800 lives. The trials concluded everything was wrapped up and it was just ruled an unfortunate accident. What's interesting and something that I wanna throw out there and something that I've read a couple times is how part of this blame can certainly be placed at the feet of Abraham Lincoln. He was the one who sent Reuben Hatch to, Miss to Mississippi instead of having him removed entirely from the army. Instead of him being dishonorably discharged for his bribery and his schemes and for everything that he was caught red-handed doing because of political greed, he was allowed to continue to do this work and to lead to causing this disaster. So there are really five people that you can hold responsible for this. There is a bit of a silver lining that comes out of this in the form of the Hartford Steam Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company. Um, there was no governing body for steam boilers, but now there was. People to provide insurance, people to um, inspect them, ensure that they are safe, um, and actually Hartford Steam Boiler still exists today as a part, a subsidiary of Munich Ray, which is an insurance company. Another thing that came out of this is the Sultana Survivors Association, which was the group of survivors who would meet annually to have a meal, to read the name of those who were lost, um, and to just come together to remember what they had been through and find a level of camaraderie in that. Which is actually still upheld today by the Sultana Descendants Association, which is a group of people descended from survivors who meet as regularly as they can. This image is actually from their 2021 meetings. So this happened very recently. Um, they come together, 
And their goal is to really share the story, to spread it so that people can remember it, so that more of us know about this thing that happened. Also, interestingly, in um, 1992 or 1982, my my apologies, um, a Loki, a local archaeologist named Jerry Potter, um, who also wrote a book about Sultana, um, led a team who discovered what they believed to be the remains of Sultana's hull. The Mississippi River, interestingly, has migrated east of where its position was in the 1860s. Um, and as it moved, Sultana just sort of got buried under more and more layers of mud. And so they believe that they found it underneath a soybean field in Arkansas, um, just off of the Mississippi River. Um, no formal archaeology has happened. They can't confirm yet, but they're pretty sure based on where the positioning is that they've found Sultana. So we can hope certainly that they will, will bring up part of it someday. Um, there are some memorials to Sultana that are scattered out through uh, the Mississippi area, um, but there aren't really any big memorials as of right now. Um, most of them are like the image that you're seeing here, which is a small one in Memphis um, that commemorate the event, but don't bring too much attention to it. Really, it just sort of disappeared, which given what was happening in April of 1865, you can argue was justifiable. Um, but I certainly think it's somewhat our responsibility to share the story as much as we can um, and to bring more light to something that is really a significant part of our history. Fortunately, there is a museum that is in the works. Um, they actually come a long way over the past couple of years. They're currently taking pledges for donations um, and starting to build together the plan uh, for their museum. So the Sultana Disaster Museum, this is an image uh, of their proposed location, um, which is actually making use of an abandoned school. Um, this is in Marion, Arkansas, uh, and it's it's really an interesting thing. And and their their goal again is just to really make sure that we remember this disaster and that we can bring it more to the forefront of our our collective memory. So to give you a few resources, if you're interested in learning more about Sultana, um, Sultana Disaster Disaster Museum .com is their website. Um, and the Sultana Association.com is the Descendants Association. You don't have to be a descendant to get involved in this story if you're interested in it. Um, you can also read The Sultana Tragedy by Jerry O. Potter, um, who's a really interesting guy, and that's one of the books that I read preparing for this. Um, a few years ago, also, The Loss of uh, or Remember the Sultana, um, which is currently available on Amazon Prime Video, um, a documentary was put together to tell the whole story, and it's a really, really interesting to uh, watch. You can also read Loss of Sultana and Reminiscence of Survivors. You can find copies of that pretty readily. We have one in the Marinus Museum Library. Um, which is the first-hand account of people who survived this disaster um, compiled by Chester Berry, who we talked about just a little while ago. Uh, and with that, we come to the end of the presentation. Uh, I see that there's a couple things in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Brock, for that presentation. It was wonderful. And I, like you, did not know very much about that story at all. So um, we, in, we enjoyed that. Yes, there are a couple of questions. Okay. All right, so they're both from Mike and Mike is actually from Oklahoma, but joined us in the galleries a few weeks ago. Um, so first, uh, in the picture of the Sultana, smoke was only coming from one smokestack. It is possible that repairs were not really completed and they were not using all the boilers due to the one not being repaired. Hence, it had to overpressure the remaining boilers to make significant power to go upriver against the current. So, gotcha. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's certainly possible. Unfortunately, because everything is gone, we don't have anything that we can really look to to see exactly what happened. So, yeah, it's it's entirely possible. There are also, interestingly, um, if you're curious, there are. Uh, a few like rumors and whispers that are out there surrounding the story of the idea of um, what's called a coal torpedo, which was um, an explosive device that was designed to look like a piece of coal um, and then would be like just fed into a furnace like normal um, and then would detonate and explode. There are rumors, there is nothing, absolutely nothing honestly to like prove that that was at all something that happened. Um, but there are rumors and there are people out there who think that it could have been a sabotage sort of thing. Um, the much more likely explanation is that, you know, a boiler was in disrepair um, and wasn't properly taken care of and couldn't handle what it was expected to do. Right. 
and that actually brings me to the next comment that Mike uh, has another thing to remember about riverboat steam engines is they use the water directly from the river. This water has silt in it, which deposited in the boiler tubes, hence allowing the boiler tubes to overheat where the silt has built up. Similar to the time you talked about the boat tilting to one side, allowing the metal to overheat. The build yes. of the silt would, would, um, could also make the boiler tubes overheat and explode. This is another potential cause of the boiler explosion. Yeah, yeah, I read that. And these tubular boilers, from what I've read in particular, were really prone to having problems with buildup like that, um, that would have, you know, obviously added to the, the problems that it was experiencing. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, we thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you'll enjoy, uh, join us for another virtual program soon. Great job, Brock. Thank you so much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.